Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today or this evening. Uh, my name is Dan Hamilton. I direct the Global Euro Program at the Wilson Center. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, this evening to have with us uh, former ambassador to the United States, Peter Westmacott, uh, talking about his new book. I even have a copy of it. Uh, they call it Diplomacy and uh, 40 years of representing Britain abroad. And we're delighted that he's able to join us today in conversation with historian Michael Vashloss. Uh, and we, what we're going to do is have them uh, have a conversation about the book. Uh, let Michael uh, take it away uh, to lead that conversation. But it, uh, as, as the conversation goes on, we'd like to include you in it as well. Uh, you can participate uh, by joining us with comment or question. The way you do that uh, in this uh, type of featured virtual existence we have is to send us an email with your question to GEP, Global Europe Program, GEP at wilsoncenter.org, or send us a tweet at GEP, wilsoncenter.org. Uh, so uh, I'll remind you of that later in the audience, but uh, let's turn now to the conversation. Um, Michael, uh, I turn to you to start us off and to talk about the new book. Please. Wonderful, thank you, Dan. Uh, I somehow have a copy of the book right here too, which I recommend that everyone buy 10 and read it 10 times, uh, maybe before the evening is over. Uh, you'll find it well worth your while. They call it diplomacy. Uh, I'm in Washington, D.C., and we have us with us the great Sir Peter Westmacott. Peter, do you want to tell everyone where you are? Michael, good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm sitting in my flat in London, so we're four hours behind you. Indeed, Ahead and we're you. so glad Ahead to have you. you do this <laughs> and love the book. Uh, and everyone knows who Peter is, so I think rather than taking time going through his August biography, I would say one thing, and that is, we have with us one of the most effective diplomats of the last half century anywhere in the world. So we're really lucky because this is the first time he's really gone through his life and talked about what he's done. And also particularly, he tells us about the role of a diplomat in an age that is very different from when the first diplomats began to operate in world history. And I guess maybe Peter, the best thing is, uh, how did you come to write the book? Have you been thought of thinking of doing this for decades, or was there a moment of revelation? Well, Michael, thank you, and, and thank you, everybody who's joined us online. It's a huge honor to be here, and such fun to be with you, Michael, a friend of many, many years standing. And thank you for making the time. Um, mm. No, I hadn't think, been thinking of writing this book. In fact, for a long time, I thought I would not do so. I did not keep a diary. I did not walk out of the office with all my classified papers saying this could be of some value uh, in future years. But when my time finished after 43 and a half years, I think it was, of working for a combination of the British government, the Royal Family, the European Commission, um, a number of people said to me, you've had a fun time, you've done some interesting things, you've done some real diplomacy. And by the way, lots of people want to know what it's all about. And what, during the few months that I did some teaching at Harvard after I finished in Washington, where I thought all those brilliant young things would be interrogating me on foreign policy and what about the nuclear deal with Iran and where are we going with Saudi Arabia and how do we deal with Vladimir Putin? Not a bit of it. All these brilliant people wanted to know what was it like being a diplomat and mm -hmm. how do you get into the foreign service and you know what kind of pressures are there on a, your family and do you have to speak foreign languages? And so I put all that together and, and a number of people who'd said, you know, there's a book in you, Peter, you better try and put it down on, on paper. And eventually I did with a little bit of help from the pandemic, which gave me a little bit more time sitting here in my London apartment. And so the result after a lot, <laughs> a lot of editing, sort of thing that you know how to do backwards, but I've never done before, uh, is the book that you're kind enough to have just in front of you. Well, it's a wonderful result. And, and one of the things that you talk about in the book is, I've known you, what we've known each other probably getting pretty close to 30 years although neither of us is old enough to have known anyone for 30 years. But, you know, and during that time, you talk about your early life and how you got into diplomacy. And I knew some of it, but I sure did not know a lot of it. So could you tell us a little bit, you know, not just what you say in the book, but you know, how early in your life did you decide that this is what you wanted to devote your life and career to? Well, I didn't have the faintest idea what foreign office and diplomacy were when I was young. 
Uh, I was born and brought up in a small village in the southwest of England, went to school, uh, went on to college, uh, quite liked foreign languages, hadn't traveled as a child, but I do remember going to live in France for a few months between high school and, and college uh, to brush up a little bit on what I'd learned in the classroom. And uh, a French friend who, who gave me a room in his apartment in exchange for me trying to teach him some English claims that we had a very meaningful conversation when I was about 18 years old uh, after he'd given me a holiday job in his factory doing some uh, processing of orders for uh, electric tools and said to me, well, you're rubbish at business, so you better go into government <laughs> uh, and, and maybe something like diplomacy would suit you. I have no recollection of this conversation. And before I went to university, I don't remember thinking about it at all. And so in, in reality, I think that when I was uh, doing my, my three years at Oxford, I talked to people whose judgment I trusted, who knew me, asked for their advice. And a number of people said, well, why don't you have a go at the Foreign Office? Um, we think it would uh, suit you. So I filled in the forms and uh, went to the interviews and waited to hear. And back in those days, Mike, if you remember, um, we were pretty lucky. The, less than 10% of the British population went to university. Uh, now it's near 50, 55. And then those of us who did and had that good fortune, we were almost um, embarrassed by the choice of jobs that we could go for when we left. Not that it was, uh, I just had to say to the Foreign Office, please take me and they opened the door. It was quite competitive even then, but there were other things to do. And so uh, it was a, one of several options that I looked at. I was a bit nervous when I started out. What if I don't like it? What if I'm no good? Will I be able to try something else instead? Um, so anyway, I gave it a go. And apart from a flutter or two halfway through my career when I thought, is this really for me? Or is, are the strains on the family a bit too much to bear? I stayed there for, as I was saying, 43 and a half years. And every day was different. And almost all of it, I loved. Okay, now just to the audience, I just want to interject that you're hearing a very modest version of the truth. This was someone who I have reason to know from third parties was a star from the beginning and was seen as such. But if you can set what Peter has just said in context, I think we can come out with some version of what, what really happened. And so what, what was your first year as a diplomat? What year are we talking about? Um, it's back in the dark ages, Michael, 1972. 72. And I started out as the junior desk officer for Oman and South Yemen. Mm -hmm. in the Middle East Department of the Foreign Office. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, just to give, just as a benchmark, how was the job, not only that job, but the job as diplomat in general, or working on national security and foreign policy, how did, how did what one person could do in 1972 differ from what one person can do today? Given, you know, development of communications, transportate, you know, some of the things that you yes. write about the way the, the ways that the yes. world has changed. I think in those days, leaving aside the ability of, you know, a new entrant who was still uh, you know, learning how to type his shoelaces uh, to make a difference. Back then, a well-placed senior diplomat with a certain amount of experience could make quite a significant difference. So at that stage, we had diplomats who were more or less running uh, a number of what are now independent states in the Persian Gulf. We had political residents who were in charge, if you like, there. I remember just a couple of years after I began my first posting in Tehran, running into my then ambassador who was back home on his mid-tour leave. He'd been there two years and you used to get one vacation in your four years when the Shah's regime was looking a, a little bit shaky and I asked him why he was still there, in a sense, why are you not back at town? And uh, the answer was, well, if we rush back, maybe that would suggest that we were not fully confident of the Shah's ability to survive. But that ambassador went back, the day he arrived, he saw the Shah, and I think it's no secret to report that that night he cabled back to London saying, the game is over. Mm -hmm. You know, the peacock throne is not going to be with us any longer. So an individual's judgment was critical. Did he have the ability to prop up that throne or to save it? No, he did not. Um, that was beyond, I think, the ability of any single individual. But I think in the days of, of slower communication, the diplomatic bag, 
Um, no no cable television, no, no, no cable internet. Television, no Twitter, no Teams, no Zoom. Um, the individual on the spot was left much more to his own devices uh, than is the case now. Yeah, you were writing about a case I know about uh, Joe Kennedy when he was ambassador of the court of St. James in the late 1930s. Just tell for just, just for a moment for those who don't know what he was able to do on his own in the old days. Well, Michael, of course, this is a trick question. Michael's one of his first books, if not your first book. Was it was, but a long time ago. So I want to hear, hear, so hear your- he's a real I, I think it's this. a good example of if in those days, if you made a choice who thought differently from a president, it could really have a big impact on history. Yeah. And what we had then was um, Joe Kennedy and the Kennedy family, of course, many of them had come from uh, Ireland, late 19th century with a great deal of uh, baggage, hostility towards the colonial power, if you like, of, of Britain, as did a lot of, uh, of uh, Irish American Catholics in particular, Irish American Protestants had come usually of their own volition without either the potato famine or the other the real economic hardship, which had driven so many people out of Ireland in the late 19th century. And I think, you know, pretty hostile to the old colonial power. And when he was ambassador in London in the late 1930s, I think he'd more or less given up on the United Kingdom's ability to survive against Hitler. Right. I'm never quite sure whether he was pro-Hitler in terms of personal sympathy or simply made a pragmatic judgment that Britain wasn't going to be able to survive very long on its own. Because after all, in, in 1940, by the time we got to 1940, before America uh, came into the war at the end of 1941, we were on our own for quite mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. A bit of help from our friends kept us afloat, but it was very tricky. And so he was not terribly supportive. Uh, he was quite supportive of, of what was going on in Germany. And in the end, um, correct me if I'm wrong, he was pushed out and the extraordinary John Winant came in, who played a staggeringly important role, which most people don't know anything about, of trying to keep morale going. And for example, going to talk to the miners in a coal, coal mine strike in North of England as the American ambassador to say, look guys, this is not just about a government you might hate or a conservative politician. This is about the survival of freedom uh, and of your country. And may I tell you as a friend, as the ambassador of the United States, uh, the best thing is not to destroy your country when Hitler is busy trying to do just that. So, I mean, people like that, extraordinary ability to make a real difference. Huge. Uh, so that was the 30s. Contrast that to the time you were in Washington, uh, the, the time of the second term, basically, of Barack Obama. How was the job different by then? The job by of then, ambassador, this, in this case, going the other way. By then, of course, we had uh, instant uh, communications between capitals. We had prime ministers and uh, presidents talking to each other whenever they wished to do so. It wasn't always that often. Uh, there were moments when they didn't wish to talk to each other when somebody was cross with somebody else. You had the Secretary of State and the British Foreign Secretary in touch, the Defense Secretaries, the Chiefs of Staff, and so on. They were all in touch with each other the whole time. And that meant, I think, that the person on the spot probably had a bit less influence although the relationship which the US ambassador in London had with the prime minister, whoever it was, in my judgment over the last half century, has always been pretty important. You know, whether it's as simple as giving David Cameron a tennis court to play on and having nice private conversations <laughs> before and after, mm -hmm. uh, or whether it's Admiral Crow being hugely supportive of uh, John Major's attempts to try to get the IRA to lay down their arms in Northern Ireland, uh, which was a very important part of the 1990s diplomacy, you know, the individual on the spot could make a difference. But I would say by the time I'd got to Washington, uh, that was becoming more difficult. I like to think that I and my embassy and my colleagues had very good access to the NSC, to the White House, to other parts of the administration that we needed to do business with. But if you said to me over those four years, you know, where were you actually able to make much of a difference beyond giving advice on handling the relationship both to the White House and to 10 Downing Street and so on, I would probably have to say that it was when I and the ambassadors of the other permanent members of the Security Council went up on Capitol Hill to defend the policy of the Obama administration uh, in front of a lot of senators, both Democratic uh, and Republican, on the Iran issue, when a lot of people were feeling under heavy lobbying from Bibi Netanyahu that they didn't want to support 
uh, what we call the JCPOA, the deal to, to stop Iran developing a nuclear weapons program. And I think up there, we probably, between us, the Russian ambassador, the Chinese ambassador, the French, the German and I, uh, we did have some impact on the way in which Congress eventually voted and ensuring that, um, that there was not a sufficient majority to override uh, a presidential veto if it came to that, if, if the Congress had decided to vote down the agreement. So you got here and you met President Obama, whom you had not met before, correct? Correct. I had not. And what surprised you about him? You got to know him fairly well, I would say. Uh, what, what surprised you about him and about the administration that you might not have known before from afar? Well, I was very lucky at the beginning, Michael, because shortly after Susie and I arrived in Washington, early uh, 2012, there was a virtual state visit in March of that year, organized for David Cameron and senior members of the British government, which was in a sense a thank you for a hugely successful state visit, which the Obama family had paid to London as the, as the guests of the Queen the year before. And as it happened, it was wonderful spring, the White House garden looked amazing, a great big banquet in a tent. It, it, it does not look that way anymore, I hasten to <laughs> report. It, it may yet look that way again. Well, it did then. Yep. And we had magnolias, we had roses, we had, you know, uh, wonderful time in the garden. But I remember also that the president, uh, President Obama, Michelle Obama, you know, had a small group of us up into the private quarters of the White House and invited the Camerons and immediate entourage to you know, look out across Pennsylvania Avenue and up at Washington Monument and towards Capitol Hill on the most fabulous evening. And it was very intimate. It was very friendly. Uh, it was very amusing. As you know, the president is a man of, of immense charm. And I think we all felt not only very welcome, but that this was, you know, pretty special relationship. So I think that was a great start. Uh, then I think the second thing I would say, which is perhaps a little bit less um, enthusiastic, is that for all that, it was never that easy for even close allies like the United Kingdom. Um, perhaps it was easier for some others like, uh, I don't know, the representative of Israel or the United Arab Emirates uh, to do so. But it wasn't that easy to influence the actual policy making process. Because what I found was that the NSC and the, and the rest of the, the principals who got together within the US government to make difficult policy decisions, did their work dutifully and rigorously and to a very high standard, and then tended to tell the allies afterwards once they decided what they wanted to do and invite us all to join. And part of what I tried to do was to get them to take close allies into their confidence a little sooner so that we could all be ready to act uh, simultaneously when necessary in, in response to international crises. And it took me a little while to work out how best uh, to, get, to get that process working in what I felt was the most efficient way. And again, if I might supplement what Peter is saying, uh, when an ambassador is as well thought of and listened to as Peter was, it shows how an ambassador really can be influential in the modern era. I'd make the argument that you had on the whole much better and deeper and more serious relations with a lot relationships with a lot of members of Congress than your counterpart might have had 60 years ago, for instance. And the fact that you could argue for the Iran deal, I do know from third parties that that, that had some influence on people that if you had been someone who had less impact, that would not have happened. Well, that's kind of you to say, I mean, to be honest, without having a clue that that would become an important part of my job, if you like, in the latter quarter of my time in Washington, it had always struck me, both then and from the earlier time that I'd spent in Washington as a political counselor in the embassy, that getting to know people on the Hill was a fundamental part of the job of, a, of an ambassador who wanted to be effective. And you never knew when you would need to talk to the people sure. who you got to know and, and all sorts of unlikely subjects. And, and best, best to do it ahead of the time that you need to, to go and see them. Best to do it ahead of the time so that you've got the relationship in place uh, if you need to talk to somebody about something difficult. Yeah, no, exactly right. Uh, how much did you see Vice President Biden during the time that you were here? Well, the Vice President, as you know, lives in, in the House of the Naval Observatory, which is just up the hill from where the, the wonderful British ambassador's house is in, in Massachusetts Avenue. I, I, I wish we could say that we planned it that way, but that's just sort of a, a happy result of our having chosen that house for Vice Presidents to live in. 
Well, and we got lucky when we bought that piece of land in the 1920s and uh, decided to, to build the only house in the Western Hemisphere by the great British architect Edwin Lutyens, and we're pretty proud of it. It's being renovated now. Um, so my, my colleague uh, and friend Karen Pierce isn't yet in the house, but she, she will be soon. You know, the first few times I would see the vice president, it was usually him being the extraordinarily gracious man that he is, apologizing for the clattering of the helicopters going over the top of our garden you know, all weekend, whether or not he was there while everybody practiced the landing and the takeoff and the emergency routines and the rest of it. But then also, you know, they, he and, and, and Dr. Jill Biden would, would come to our house and, and we would go to theirs. And they were hugely supportive of things that we were doing uh, with military veterans. Um, when Prince Harry and, and Prince William were staying with us, doing things with the UK um, uh, wounded military veterans, they would often come and be supportive. And different events, whether it was signing the condolence book on the death of Margaret Thatcher when Vice President Biden came and spent an hour talking to us all about her and the relationship. There were a whole lot of different occasions. And then, of course, he would tease me endlessly by saying, you know, Peter, I'm a little bit English, but I'm a great deal more Irish than I am British. <laughs> so you better watch out. <laughs> yes, that he was always has been and is now very upfront about that. <laughs> uh, how early in your time here did you begin to think that Donald Trump might be a serious future president? Since, since I cannot yet read the reports that you sent back for about, <laughs> what, 25 more years? I was never uh, very good at um, predicting the future, Michael. But what I can say is that in January of 2016, which was when I left, and the last political gathering that I had with some of my favorite pundits who used to come around for off the record breakfast every few weeks or so just for fun and to kick the tires and discuss the state of the universe. The last time round, I asked everybody to say, who's going to be the Republican candidate and who's going to be the next president? Mm -hmm. And the Republican candidate, um, false modesty apart, I was the only one who said Donald Trump. It, this was January. Uh, most people thought it was going to be Ted Cruz. Mm -hmm. at that point. And as for who's going to be the next president, we were all wrong. Not one of us predicted in early January of 2016 that it would be Donald Trump. And in mitigation of our failure to get it right, I think Donald Trump himself didn't even think he'd be president, even on the day that he won the election. So I don't think we were alone in not, <laughs> not quite predicting the future. <laughs> I think that's probably fair. And And I should also say to the audience, I've always found Peter actually more astute about American politics than most professional experts on American politics whom I know. Uh, in retrospect, what do you think led to Trump's election in 2016, if you had to name two or three things? He says that Brexit helped him. Um, I don't think that's directly true, but I know what he means. and. I think a number of the elements that led to a majority of those who voted, not a majority of the British people, but 37% of the electorate, but that was enough, to vote in favor of the UK leaving the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, I think they were motivated in many ways by some of the reasons why people voted for Donald Trump. That is to say, uh, when you're feeling fed up with life, when your middle class incomes have been stagnant for a long time, when you think political elites are out of touch, when you think the bankers got away with murder in 2008, and not one of them went to jail and you're still paying the bill, um, and you feel that you live in a kind of flyover country which nobody pays any attention to and not really interested in, in your own life, then when somebody asks you a question, the answer may well be hell no, whatever the question is. And I think my, my own view is that the Brexit referendum, which, which led to the United Kingdom leaving the European Union, was not a particularly well thought out. It wasn't particularly well set out. And indeed, the terms of the departure were quite different from what the advocates of, of that um, decision were, were, were selling the British people back in, in, in 2016. But nevertheless, that was it. And I remember my French friend saying at the time when David Cameron organized the referendum, said he was going to hold one, be very careful what you wish for, because we have experience of referenda, and the answer is always hell no. Doesn't matter what the question is, because it is an opportunity for people in a democracy where they normally only get the chance to change a government every five years to say that they're fed up with life. Because it's, it's almost pathological. 
So almost pathological. So I've always thought that a referendum is an extremely crude political instrument and a dangerous one. And probably if you're gonna use it for a major decision, you ought to arrange in advance that it has to be at least a majority of the electorate, or if not two thirds of the votes cast. And we did neither of those things. And we've ended up with a decision which is, is proving quite tricky to implement, to put it mildly. But I think for Donald Trump, that vote, which was showing the people who felt that they'd been disregarded and um, whose, whose, whose incomes were going down or at least not up, uh, they were feeling, well, this can be done. Uh, and he certainly felt that this was a momentum. There was wind in his sails, which was encouraged by the vote in the United Kingdom. And many of the similar considerations that led people to vote for him were the considerations that led people to vote to take the UK out of Europe. Sure sounds right. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Dan, I think what we'd like to do, we're going to go till six and we're going to try to be disciplined about ending by six Eastern time in the United States. Uh, we'd love to get some questions from the audience or comments, preferably questions with a question mark at the end. Uh, and Dan, do you want to have a word on how we do that? Yes. Uh Thank you, Michael. Yes, again, if you'd like to join in this conversation, you can send us an email at GEP, Global Europe Program, GEP at wilsoncenter.org, or send us a tweet at GEP wilsoncenter.org. Michael, back to you, or I have some come questions that have come in. I think let's, I think maybe what I'll do, if this is agreeable to Peter, that maybe he and I will talk for 10, 12 more minutes then come to questions and then maybe he and I'll talk at the end just to sort of wrap this up if at all possible. Uh, all right, the next question, Peter, I'm gonna ask this in the most neutral way I possibly can, which is that Donald Trump was elected in 2016. He served as president for four years. Was there any change in the special relationship between the UK and the United States? Uh, yes, I think there was. Like most British prime ministers, the one who was in 10 Downing Street when he was elected, Theresa May, and her successor, Boris Johnson, made it their business to get as close as they could to the occupant of the Oval Office. You know, that's what British prime ministers have, have long sought to do, and it becomes a top priority for any British ambassador in Washington to ensure that they're the first foot through the door or the first phone call, or whatever it happens to be. And uh, very kindly, people in the Oval Office have often gone along with that and, and humored the Brits and kept the special relationship looking good. Uh, and, and in fact, if I could interrupt, I think you'd agree with this, that they, the UK went so far in 1961 to appoint the ambassador that Ken John Kennedy wanted, which was David Ormsby Gore, who had been a family friend for decades. Exactly, yeah. And, and that's unusual in the British system. We very rarely have- That's why I mentioned, yeah. A political appointee, but I think it was a very shrewd move. And David Ormsby or Lord Harlick as he became, uh, was uh, hugely successful and had very, very good access to uh, the White House. Um, and, and had influence on issues way beyond just it, the relationship. I think, that's, I think that is exactly right. So th that is the case. But I think to try to answer your question, I think things, despite the closeness of the personal relationship which people sought to establish, I think the relationship did change because for all the talk of I'm a big Brexit fan and there's going to be a shiny new free trade agreement between the United States and the United Kingdom, in fact, Donald Trump's remarks about Brexit sometimes made life extremely difficult and he certainly caused embarrassment for Theresa May by arriving in the United Kingdom for one of the two occasions when the Queen um, played host to him, saying, um, by the way, your policy... Uh, let me stop you for a moment. Two times in four years, is that at all unusual? Two times in 18 months, Michael. Um, how, how many times did Lyndon Johnson come to England in the 1960s? I, I think the answer is zero. Zero, yes. <laughs> he was there for almost six years. Well, he came once uh, after Theresa May had offered him a state visit, and then um, that was just fine, but it was not regarded as a state visit, so he wanted to come again. And Her Majesty being the gracious monarch that she is, he came again and clearly enjoyed it. So, but despite that, I would and, say- And, and was, always on, was always on time. And was always on time, exactly. Um, but on the policy stuff, you know, whether it was on Brexit or whether it was about um, 
ensuring that NATO was in good shape and, and that our mutual uh, enemies were uh, on guard, if you like, against a, a, a strong and unified uh, Western alliance, it wasn't terribly helpful. Uh, the Trump administration placed tariffs on British exports of Scotch whiskey and shortbread biscuits from Scotland and so on. His beloved Scotland, where his mother was born and where he's got golf courses. You know, this is not something tremendously friendly. 25% tariffs, for example, costing hundreds of millions of dollars to the Scotch Whiskey Association alone, which um, somebody who was, you know, very fond of the United Kingdom would do. And I think that the way in which he was very reluctant to call out President Putin on bad Russian behavior, whether it was in the United Kingdom or further afield, was not, shall we say, very aligned with the interests of close allies like uh, the United Kingdom. And I would say more generally that the kind of unilateralist approach that he took to problem solving, not engaging with allies and doing his own thing, made it quite difficult. Uh, it was an unpredictable uh, administration. And of course, when we tried to engage with those people who were part of his team, they too would be you know, looking at the, at the tweeting, tweeting at five o'clock in the morning and wondering what the new policy was, because usually they were as blindsided as the rest of us. Oh, in interesting. Uh, so to the degree that there was damage done to the relationship, is it repairable under Biden? What kind of things should he and his Secretary of State and his new ambassador do? It feels to me as though that relationship is, is a great deal better, just as I, I'm sure it does to a lot of our, America's other very close allies and friends. Of course, many of the people whom President Biden has appointed are what I would call stars from the previous administration, people who I knew well and other ambassadors at the time knew well and who are very, very talented. P pretty much yeah. everyone, isn't that true? Pretty much everyone, yeah. I, mean, one yeah. Or two. I, don't, I don't think there's anyone, for instance, that you would not have known very well in these key jobs? Not many. I mean, Lloyd Austin at Defense, I, I, I did know, but, you know, mm -hmm. almost by chance. It wasn't as if he was, you know, he was a serving general at the time. Right. Um, so, you know, but for everybody else who's in those key positions, whether it's John Kerry or Avril Haines or Tony Blinken or Jake Sullivan and all those sort of people in and around Janet Yellen, uh, the administration of people who we all knew well. And I, I was a little apprehensive at the beginning, given how close Boris Johnson had been to Donald Trump. Um, given that there was some concern that the way in which the UK was leaving the European Union might be going to cause trouble for the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, which is a very important priority for, frankly, any US administration, but particularly for a, a Biden administration. And given that, you know, Boris Johnson and his own kind of you know, flamboyant way had used some pretty colorful language, not all of it terribly kind, uh, about certain democratic politicians in the United States, I did wonder. Uh, and of course, the President Biden had said himself, just like President Obama did, that he didn't think Brexit was a very good idea. And mm -hmm. Boris Johnson was the great advocate of Brexit. He didn't think it was good for Britain, didn't think it was good for America, didn't think it was good for European Union solidarity, didn't think it was good for Western values. Frankly, I agree with all that. Um, but, you know, it wasn't the position of the prime minister. All that said, I think they've got off to a good start. And the, the honest answer is that there's so much that the United States and the United Kingdom can and should and must now do together. Um, and you've got two big personalities who have, I think, been able to, to get off to a very good start at the personal level that I think things are, are back in good shape. And you've got an administration in Washington which is demonstrably multilateralist and consensual and wanting to work with allies in a thoughtful, strategic way. And that degree of political of predictability and thoughtfulness makes it so much easier for America's close allies to engage. Interesting. And putting on your hat of analyst of current domestic American politics, uh, how would you assess the magnitude of what Joe Biden is trying to do on a number of fronts? Well, for all the, the way in which those of us who aren't in America think that he should be focused on the rest of the world and dealing with NATO and fixing this and that problem, of course, what he's got to deal with primarily the pandemic uh, and the state of the economy and the stimulus package. And I think he's made pretty remarkable progress. He's also put together a cabinet uh, more quickly than, than most recent presidents have been able to do, get them confirmed through the United States Senate. So I think he's he's off to what seems to me a a, a, a brisk start. Uh, it's not going to be very easy because I think many of us after the 3rd of November and leaving aside the horrific events of the 6th of January, we weren't too sure at all 
that there was going to be a working majority on Capitol Hill in the Senate. And as it happens, uh, possibly thanks to President Trump's intervention, uh, the Georgia runoffs ended up giving the 50-50 uh, situation that we now have in the Senate with therefore the casting of vote with the vice president, which means that some business can get done, nominations can go through. Of course, it's not 60 votes, so it means that an awful lot of substantive legislation uh, is going to be difficult, but it means the committee chairs and so on are in the hands of uh, the same party as has the House of Representatives and the Oval Office. So I think the chances of him getting some business done are, are a good deal better than they might have been if Georgia hadn't gone the way that it did. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it does depend on, therefore, keeping on, on side uh, one or two of the critical uh, Democrats who are in perhaps vulnerable positions and working with some uh, members of the Republican Party on the other side of the aisle. But uh, if, any pres if any incoming president has experience of uh, bridging gaps and, and working the deals, and making smoke-filled rooms produce results, it seems to me that it is, it is Joe Biden. He's got long experience of that, loves people, makes it into an art form, the whole mm -hmm. process of working out what does somebody else need in order to come to terms so that we can move forward together. He's got a great record of doing that stuff. And so I think uh, that you know, the chances of getting stuff done, and look what we've seen with the stimulus package, um, are uh, perhaps better than they might otherwise be if you take a purely arithmetic approach. Uh, to the process of getting business done. But it's it's not going to be easy, and there's still the pandemic to deal with, there's still the debris from that, there's still the middle class incomes, there are still the inequality issues, there's still the issue of race, there's still, I, I fear, something that we don't talk about much outside America, the whole issue of voter suppression which is going on, which I find uh, you know, another worrying aspect of the, uh, the assault on American democracy, which the rest of us worry about because we do regard America as a leader of the free world. So there's lots of stuff for this administration to work on, but I see a president who's who's energetic, committed, active, getting on with it. Okay, I'll, I'll ask one more before we come to some questions from Dan and then I'll come back maybe a little bit before the end of the hour. Uh, looking at us, I mean, you have very close relationships here to this day. And before the pandemic, you were here a lot. But nonetheless, you were watching this mainly from the outside with some distance. So a different view from most of us who were here, especially during the last year. How much do you think our democracy was really in danger during the last year? Was that, this something that looked more like that to us because we're here in the bullseye? Or is this something that from a distance looked like a legitimate concern to you? I don't think that those of us who weren't where you are now woke up quite as rapidly as early as we should have done to the risk that democracy might really be, if you like, overturned after the 3rd of November. Yes, we all heard uh, President Trump saying that the only result that he would accept was his own victory, and that if he lost, he wouldn't have lost because it would have been rigged and unfair and the election would have been stolen. And we heard that, just like we've heard a lot of other strange things that the former president said. I'm not sure that we took it as literally as perhaps we should have done. And I'm not sure that um, it looked at that stage uh, quite as real a threat as it did come the 6th of January. And even then we saw these pictures of these kind of crazy looking groups of militias. They were almost from central casting as if it was part of a movie storming the Capitol. And we, yes, we did see a few horrendous pictures of uh, policemen being, 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 being uh, assaulted or squashed in the revolving door of the Capitol building. But I don't think even then we quite realized how close it came to the speaker and even the vice president actually losing their lives at the hands of a mob who'd been incited to go and overturn the result of the election through physical force on Capitol Hill. I mean, it, it was as dramatic as that, it seems to me now. I don't think we saw it coming in advance. I'm not sure that the, the signals that President Trump had given us all were interpreted as clearly, as, as sharply, uh, as perhaps they should have been, because it wasn't as if it was a great surprise. It wasn't as if he didn't warn us. So the answer is, um, no, I don't think we did see it coming. And it was a horrific shock, but in the end, um, the institutions held, 
and American democracy has survived and might yet be strengthened as a result of it. But I think it's probably too soon to say whether that's the case because he hasn't gone anywhere. Yep, I, I agree. So Dan, have you got some questions from the audience? And then, then yes. I'll sort of pick this up maybe in about 10 minutes or so. Sure. Yes, our first question is actually from our distinguished fellow at the Wilson Center and former president and CEO, Jane Harmon. Wonderful. Uh, and she says, I'm so happy. Distinguished fellow does not begin to do justice to yeah. her historical and current role. At the That's center. right. I'm already uh, breaking in my boots, Dan. That's the question. <laughs> Well, she says, I'm so happy this event is being hosted by the Wilson Center and thank Peter and Susie for decades of friendship. Both are committed internationalists. And yet in recent years, both the UK with Brexit and the US with the election of Donald Trump have retreated from the form of internationalism practiced since the end of World War II. Can we, should we rebuild the quote, liberal world order unquote, in both countries? Or must we rethink internationalism and its structure for the future? Well, it's a wonderful question, as I would expect from, from Jane. Um, of course, we've had four years of Donald Trump, and now you've got somebody very different. And I would say, I was just trying to say, that I think the, um, not quite the status quo ante, but a degree of order at internationalism and uh, normal behavior has been resumed already. Uh, we've got a US administration which is setting out its stool, which is giving careful thought to the big policy issues that are in front of it. Uh, and I would say, maybe I'm a little bit biased, but resuming a, a natural role of international leadership. Uh, it's gonna be tough. Uh, it's not the same as it was. You can't just go back four years and pretend that the last four years have not happened. Look at the way in which uh, Tony Blinken uh, had to deal with you know, some pretty difficult behavior from his Chinese opposite numbers in Anchorage, Alaska, just last week. You know, China is in a different place. Actually, Donald Trump did a, something of a service, I think, by making everybody wake up to the resurgence of China and what it all meant for us, and the fact that we needed to think afresh about how to deal with that issue. And this administration, I believe, is now doing that. Yeah, and it's also focusing on a number of issues to do with values and democracy and human rights in the Middle East and further afield which I think is an important part of US leadership. In the United Kingdom, uh, Brexit is, is for good, um, unless and until the United Kingdom decides that it isn't worth it, or it hasn't worked, or they were sold a pup, or that they're much worse off in a number of different ways uh, than they were within, and applies to rejoin. But that is uh, le leaving aside whether or not anybody wants us back after their other tortuous and painful uh, negotiations, if not name calling of the last four and a half years, that's not for another decade, I don't think, because it, you need to have time to let it all settle down. The United Kingdom is now uh, on its own. It's still a member of lots of other international organizations, which is why I always felt the argument that we were leaving the European Union to take back our sovereignty was always a bit over egged. You know, a degree of sovereignty has been pooled decades that's part of our international security we're not on our own we're not uh, autarkic we are part of a community of nations and, and that's how life is and that's what's been part of our security and our prosperity but we are now much more on our own we're no longer a member of the european union with some global ambitions we are an ind individual country talking about something called global britain and trying to put some flesh on the bones of that concept so i think um how that will work out depends very much on what value the United Kingdom on its own is able to add. I think the relationship with the United States, as I was saying, has gone off to pretty good start, but we've just had a big integrated review of our, of our defense and foreign policy, which is going to rearrange, uh, not, not, I won't say the deck chairs of the Titanic, it's not at all that, but it's rearranging our capabilities, hopefully to, to face up to the new threats, which are so much different to how things were conventionally when everything was measured in terms of fighter aircraft, tanks and aircraft carriers. And we've got to think again, and we've got to look again at, at where the threats are coming from and how best we deal with them. And I think that, you know, the UK is going to try and do that. But what worries me a bit is, is whether you can do that without being part of another organization. I think the, the era of international institutions solving problems um, 
may have passed its peak and it may be about strategic alliances between like-minded groups of countries in certain parts of the world coming together to deal with specific localized threats and we can always be a part of that as and when our interests uh, are um, in play that requires a whole lot of new thinking a whole lot of new relationships it actually gives scope for a number of individual players to become more important than they have been in the past where they were simply dominated by the big players in the big international organizations that potentially could mean that the united kingdom all by itself global britain can play um, an even bigger role than as a member of the 28 strong european union the biggest weakness of leaving the european union i suspect is going to be economic uh, but there is a big challenge to try to ensure that in those other areas that you're talking about we still have a role to play i think we've got the talent i think we've got the experience we've got the history we've got people we've got capabilities we've got relationships but it's going to require a lot of hard work the term of art one sees increasingly on that is variable geometry. Yes. Put, put piecing together different groupings. Here's a question from a former colleague of yours, actually of mine as well, uh, Bob Pearson. So Ambassador Robert uh, Pearson says, delighted to see the interview. As we serve together in Turkey, could you share your thoughts on Turkey's challenges today and how UK and US actions might help put things back on a better track? Well, Bob Pearson and, and his wife Maggie were great colleagues and friends of ours when we were in Turkey. I uh, hate to think, not you know, almost 20 years ago. So, Bob, great. To, thank you for the question. I think that we were there, he and I, at a very uh, important time for the development of Turkey in lots of ways. It had been through a series of rather uh, dysfunctional coalitions, which hadn't done very well, some economic and financial crises. And then everything was blown away by the arrival of, of uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan and the AK Party with a single party majority uh, in the general election, which took place at the end of 2002. And for the first few years, you know, a lot of very good things were done. Reform, stabilization of the economy, greater respect for human rights, about abolition of the death penalty, a new outreach towards Kurdish minority questions. You know, a whole lot of things were going really extremely well. But that was then, and this is now, and the same person is in charge. And it's begun to, to look to me as though some of the talent pe talented people who were part of that administration have left or been pushed out. And, um, and the president is in our ways, the prime minister as he then was, has got a, a small circle of advisors who certainly in terms of the economy don't seem to have been doing a brilliant job recently. He's just fired uh, the governor of the central bank who actually for the last four months did do rather well in stabilizing the currency. Um, but otherwise, over the last few years, it's not gone well. And as we speak, I think the Turkish lira is going down again because of concerns about the management of the economy. And I'm worried that there are other things that are not going as well as they should be. There's, there was a huge roundup of a lot of people after the failed coup of July 2016, some of whom undoubtedly were involved in, in the horrendous uh, failed coup and, and assault on Turkish democracy, but some of whom were not. Uh, and there's far more journalists in jail than there should be. Far more journalists in jail in Turkey than there are even in China, uh, which is not something of which Turkey should be proud of at the moment. So how to get it working again? Uh, I mean, I had great hopes of the relationship between Turkey and the European Union when I was there, and Turkey began accession negotiations, which have not ended and are not likely to end anytime soon. It would still, in my view, be very good for the country if it met the membership criteria, but it's not likely to do that. But I think that in the medium term, short to medium term, there's an awful lot of things that are tricky in the relationship with the United States, and I'd love to see those resolved uh, before long. But it's a, it's a long list of problems. And the reality is that, uh, is, is that Turkey is at the moment you know, quite close with, with Russia, um, quite close with some of the other uh, regional countries. Uh, not doing very well with some of its um, Arab neighbors and um, moving towards, uh, if you like, language of economic and military nationalism, which one totally understands when there are elections coming up, but which slightly suggests that Turkey's commitment to the Western alliances like NATO and, and the Council of Europe, of which it is a founder member, is not as strong as it was. And I think the rest of us have to try to engage with Turkey, which is extraordinarily important country of massive potential and great human capital. We have to try to engage with them to try to make 
everybody in charge of Turkey feel that that is still the right direction of travel uh, rather than the, the much less committed and, and more inward looking, if I can put it like that, uh, position where it now seems to be. Uh, Michael, maybe one more question that I can come back to you Wonderful. Uh, for a wrap up. So here's maybe a somewhat delicate one about back to uh, being a diplomat in Washington, how the European ambassadors all related to each other and also to the EU ambassador. So often we are told by EU folks uh, with the treaties and everything, you know, we're all now speaking with one voice. There's an EU foreign policy. Um, but in my experience, Washington's sort of the last place where you see that because each ambassador is, of course, trying to protect their bilateral relationship with the United States. So the question is, how, how does that work? How does that delicate dance work among the EU ambassadors, both with the EU ambassador, that person themselves, but also how everyone works together or not? I think it must be a little tricky now, Dan, because if you take some of the foreign policy issues that are out there, like you know, dealing with Russia uh, and uh, the gas pipeline, the, the Nord Stream that's been talked about, or dealing with Libya, where you've got European member states and the United States and in different places in terms of the, uh, the configuration of the different parties there, uh, or whether it's about China handling, you know, they're not all on the same page. I think I was very lucky when we were in Washington and we were dealing with Iran, which I touched on before, uh, there was a unity um, of all the EU member states, uh, plus amazingly, you know, Russia and China as well. Uh, and the EU uh, representative, the, the ambassador of the European Union, who was the head of their delegation, uh, was with us as well. And so we were able to pull in the same direction with the United States in a way that was a, perhaps a high point of international diplomacy and certainly for the, the EU and the other members of the Security Council. But I think it must be a great deal harder now. I don't remember as, if you like, falling out between the EU member states uh, on any significant foreign policy issues uh, while I was there, though in, in, in earlier years, there had been some difficult moments, as you can imagine, within the UK and Ireland over what to do over uh, the troubles in Northern Ireland. But that was you know, some years earlier and we, we got over it in the end, but it was, it was quite tricky. Uh, and I think on something like Cyprus, uh, where there is a renewed attempt to deal with the last remaining territorial dispute of the European Union right now, um, there is plenty of scope for e EU member states not to be in the same place and for some of them not to be on the same page as the United States, which I'm sure would love to play a role as it has in the past uh, in trying to um, bridge the differences and find a political settlement there, as is the UK, which is, happens to be a guarantor power of the of the island of Cyprus and the, and the 1960 settlement, which is the one that no longer works. So it, it, it's, it's usually worked is the answer, but I suspect that when there are foreign policy issues on which there are sharp disagreements, the individual member states just have to look after their own bilateral relationship and conduct their own lobbying uh, and uh, have their own policy discussions. And the United, the common foreign and security policy simply has to be parked while those differences are worked through. Thank you. Back to you, Michael. Well, thank you, Dan. Yeah, that sounds great. Peter, I thought one last thing. The problem with this book is he's been at the center of history for 50 years. It's almost as if someone has planted him in every scene that you'd want to have him there reporting on and analyzing in real time from London to Iran to Turkey to two spells in Washington. And also what we haven't mentioned yet during this hour, and maybe we can close with is your very important role, this is me speaking, not Peter, uh, with the royal family. Tell a little bit about what you feel the role of the royal family will be in the future. Well, I had uh, three years at, at quite a, a delicate time uh, working for the royal family because it was uh, during the years when Prince and Princess of Wales were going their, their separate ways. So uh, it, was a, it, it was a difficult and a painful time. But I, I emerged from that experience uh, a great deal wiser, a, a good deal more tired <laughs> <laughs> because the media were all over the whole story. And if they weren't all over the principles, they were going for the, um, uh, uh, the rest of us. 
Right. And it was a it was a difficult time, but I certainly emerged with a, a very strong uh, belief in support for and admiration for uh, the royal family. It is a very difficult institution to be a part of because if you were inventing it from scratch, you wouldn't start where you are now. You know, how would you justify uh, being there through an accident of birth and being the head of a church as well as the head of a state, which is what Her Majesty is, um, and, and all the curious rules and things that, that go with it. It is fundamentally an institution based on, as I say, heredity, which is an accident of birth, privilege, and which works because there is this extraordinarily strong sense of duty and responsibility which goes with it. And that, in my view, is, is what underpins the respect and affection for the royal family, which we have in the United Kingdom. Now, if you don't have a monarchy, you want to have some other head of state. What are you going to do? You could have a much, much more expensive arrangement and have elections every four years for a president uh, with all the secret service and the rest of the, you know, the process and, and billions of dollars spent on those elections. And you end up with somebody who is a political figure who is the head of state. I think that the British people are quite comfortable having somebody who is above politics, which is why uh, some commentators in our media get rather upset when Her Majesty is dragged into daily politics. And you know, part of the game is that the royal family are not in politics. But I think people quite like that. And then they can, uh, they can throw rotten tomatoes at their political leaders as much as they like and, and chuck them out in elections if they don't like the look of it. But there is that continuity of the nation and which I think one indication of how well it works is the fact that you've got, I think it's 16 other countries choose to have the queen as her head of state, um, as their head of state, and 50 others around the world choose to be part of the Commonwealth, of which the queen happens to be the head and Prince Wales is going to be the next head, but is not automatically run by the Brits like La Francophonie is run by and led by France. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very much a, an equal community of nations, but there are 50 something uh, different countries which choose to be a part of it. And they are brought together by a sense of, of shared values, but I would say also um, respect for and admiration of uh, the British royal family. So for me, it's there. It, it does a brilliant job uh, in very difficult circumstances. But you ask me about the future, I think it's still going to be there. And, you know, Her Majesty has been there for more than 60 years. She and Prince Philip are coming towards the end of their life. I had the great good fortune to work for the man who is the heir to the throne and who will be king before very long. You know, who knows when? So I have every confidence that the institution will continue to, to thrive. Interesting. In any case, the book is, they call it Diplomacy. Thank you so much for doing this, Peter. As I said, I highly recommend it for about 20 different reasons. Uh, the other thing is that uh, one tiny benefit is that unlike American books, this comes actually with a, a bookmark. Uh, <laughs> just one of the ways that uh, your country is doing better than ours is. I wish our country could do that as well. In any case, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Dan. Thank you to the Wilson Center and your program. And all I can say is I'm sorry that we're not all together in the same room and hope we can do that soon. Dan? Thank you, Michael. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, late hour, your, your time. Uh, but we are promoting the book. Uh, uh, one will be able to see this interview on our website. And uh, we look forward to staying in touch with you. And I want to thank our audience for joining us today. Uh, thank you all and have a good evening. Take Michael, care. Dan, all of you, thank you so much for the privilege of being with you this evening. I really do appreciate thank it. Thank you, Peter. Loved okay. it. Good night. Everyone Bye. be well. Thank you. Okay. Good okay. night. Take care. Good night.